Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate this opportunity. This is my first OpenSUSE conference, so I'm quite excited. Um, before, usually, I'm giving talks more in, a, say, a scientific context, and I assume that you guys are more familiar to giving talks and listening to talks, which are very software development focused. And so today I thought we just meet in the middle and I will tell you a little bit about my experience in developing a scientific software at the University of Jena and how we at some point decided to start a company to provide the software as a service to commercial customers and how the whole software project um, benefits from that. And maybe first a short introduction about myself. I'm Marcus, I studied bioinformatics in Jena. I did my PhD uh, also there and uh, during my THD, I developed different computational methods for small molecule identification. It's basically saying it, it's computational methods for analyzing scientific measurement data. And all of these methods are now also included into our software project. And yes. And um, now I became a postdoc, and a few years ago, we also decided to start our company. And so four years ago, I became a co-founder of this company. And now I'm here. I'm still um, affiliated with the University of Jena on one hand, and also with our company, and trying now to tell you how this is going on. Um, this talk is going to be threefold. In the first part, I will tell you a little bit about how software development works in academia. And then secondly, I will talk about how, how, how everything started at the university. And then in the third part, I tell you a little bit more about the company and the commercialization. And so let me start um, with the citation. So to put it in simple words, um, the work to increase accessibility of software tools goes largely unrewarded uh, in academia. And I don't mean this as a complaint about academia. I just want to tell you how things are because academia is meant to provide novel findings and it is less about providing a user-friendly software to a user. So that means uh, when you have a PhD and you're researching on a specific topic, you're trying a lot of different ideas to find a solution to this problem. And with this, you're developing a software to test this and you prioritize your development for easy testing and good evaluation of your methods because maybe one of your 50 ideas is working out and in the end now you got this one and if you have a novel scientific finding you publish a paper about it and the software is really as a means for the paper for evaluating everything and obviously you also put this out to the community um, that other people in principle can use it but usually the methods are provided as a script or with a very simplistic user interface and especially from the background i'm coming from bioinformatics the the end users of our methods come more from the life science field so they are now computer scientists and for them it's then really difficult to make use of this software because they cannot code they need a nice shiny interface and they need easy accessible software to make use of it and also because scientific software is very very complex i don't know sorry about that um, it's very complex um, because the problem at hand is very complex, the, the software actually needs a lot of training material and documentation, not for you to 
find the start button for this tool, but more to understand the parameters, the problem, uh, or the problem and the software require, and to understand the output, understand when can I trust the results of my, my output, um, because I'm providing now um, analysis of some measurement data, and I don't know whether the results are good or bad. I'm very sorry about what's, what's happening now. Um, okay, we're good to go now. And I'm very sorry, maybe I can try a quick fix. I don't know what with the connection. Is it the HVI? I'm trying to maybe maybe this one will help. So we're still about it. Sorry. Um, so yeah. So really, you need a lot of explanation on what the software is providing to you, how you can interpret the results. And usually in academia, you never find enough time to provide all this information. You, you just have to rush on to the next project, and you cannot really have long-term support what, um, uh, for the method you developed so far. And really, I don't mean this as a complaint about academia, it's just what you can expect from a, uh, academic software and what you can't expect from academic software. And also to understand a little bit more why we then were also um, found, uh, have found a solution for us to start a company to provide more support to the software project. Um, so, yes, now a little bit more about uh, what had happened at the university and what all this project is about. So here you can see uh, the five um, founders of the Bright Giant Company. First of all, we have our professor here, and he started researching on computational methods for small molecular identification over 15 years ago now. And PhDs came and went, and they developed different algorithms to solve small puzzles of this whole problem. And all the algorithms have been then implemented also in a large software suite. And at some point, now we were this new PhD students. We also did our PhD at the Chair of Bioinformatics. We developed novel algorithms. We implemented them in the software. And over time, our software project and our computational methods got more and more popular. And we really found that it is some um, use to the scientific community and that we believe that, in principle, the things we are doing there can change the way people are identifying these small molecules. And because we knew that not every one of us will stay in academia forever, but all of us wanted to work in the scientific context and really improve this uh, software we believe in, uh, we decided at some point that it would be a good way to do this by, by starting this company. But, so first of all, I was not saying we are doing small molecule identification. So what is small molecule identification at all? So small molecules are, as their name suggests, small molecules, and they are basically everywhere. So you can find them in your blood. You probably already taken some as drugs because most drugs are small molecules. Some natural toxins are molecules and also uh, many pheromones, many flavoring agents, all of these are small molecules. And you find them in your blood, in food, in plants, in microbes, in the wastewater, basically everywhere. And the problem is just that we only know of a very tiny portion of all of the molecules in our environment which 
the molecules exactly are. And these molecules that we know, we can rediscover again and again and again. But the interesting part is now identifying the whole rest of them, because there are potentially um, the interesting ones hidden. And in general, you can take any sample, you put it in a magic machine, and it will just measure you all of these small molecules from the sample. The problem is just that it can only detect the molecules. It can't really tell you what the molecules are. So what do I mean with that? Um, this magic machine is called mass spectrometer. And if we now look at a single component, or a single molecule, what we actually want to have is this machine should tell us this is the molecular structure. But what it gives us is only the weight of the molecule. It says, so this molecule is so and so heavy. And because this is not sufficient to identify the molecule, it also breaks it into pieces and measures all the weights of the parts. So using an analogy, imagine I give you a big pile of Lego bricks. And I ask you, what was the original Lego set that you can build with it? And I don't really actually give you the whole pile, but I only tell you how heavy each stone is. So you can't differentiate them by color, or you also cannot differentiate a 2 by 2 stone from a 4 by one stone because they have the same weight. And now you should go there back and tell me what was the original Lego set. And the problem is there is not just one single set, not just 10 or 100, there are millions of these. And maybe there are even these Lego sets where we don't know how they even look like. We haven't even seen them before. And we still want to find the solution. And this is basically the problem we are trying to solve now for every molecule in the data set. So the machine measures the molecule, it breaks it into pieces, it measures the weight of each of the pieces, and this is now our puzzle to identify the molecule. And yeah, at the chair of bioinformatics, we've been now developing algorithms to solve this puzzle you know, for over 15 years. So not myself personally, but many people working there. And we used a combination of uh, combinatorial optimization on the one hand, and lately also with a lot of machine learning. And the funny thing is, machine learning is actually very bad at puzzling. So it's not good at combinatorics. But if you have these combinatorial algorithms in combination with the machine learning, they provide the data in a structured manner that the machine learning can make sense of it. And so basically, yeah, we have been researching on this now for many years, and we wanted to make the results or the software accessible to people that they can analyze their data. And we did so by providing most of our algorithms as part of Sirius, an open source project. So this already started in 2009 as um, software for molecular formula identification, so a subtask of the whole uh, process, and now contains many more uh, algorithms. So this is basically our software suite that connects every, every algorithms, every ideas we had for small molecule identification. And some years ago, what you uh, could do with it was basically you took your measurement data, and with Sirius, you could now identify the molecular formula for a compound. But the biological, uh, uh, biological scientists, they wanted to have more than just a molecular formula. They really want to have the molecule structure. And then um, people at the chair um, also developed different machine learning methods, which now were able to predict molecular structures. On the one hand, by searching the data in a very large molecular structure database with hundreds of millions of molecules. Um, and on the other hand, if a molecule is not even contained in this database, we are now able to um, categorize it based on compound classes. So telling someone it's a sugar, it's a fatty acid, it's a steroid, for example. And so these methods are all machine learning based. So they have very complex models and also Partly, they were trained on proprietary data, which we couldn't give to other people. So 
we couldn't just take these methods and put them into our client application series, and but we, we still wanted to have a good connection and one software suite uh, a user from life science can really use um, to um, yeah analyze the data. So <clears throat> we d we decided at some point to integrate all of these machine learning methods as web services into our serial software. So they are seamlessly connected that you don't really care about it. You click on a compute button and it takes the data, sends it to the web service, uh, brings the machine learning predictions back and you look at the results in your software. And now having this whole package, the software grew in popularity. And at this point, we really saw what it could do for for a scientific community, for the metabolomics um, community, how it could change the way they are analyzing the data. And we really wanted this project to thrive. And this was roughly the time where we decided uh, to bring the software to the market. So like I said, there had been different reasons why we did that. For example, that we knew we couldn't do this um, all over time in academia and we needed to find a way to still be working on this project. And on the other hand, there were also many features, many convenient features where we thought they should be included into this project, which um, academia couldn't provide or which academia shouldn't provide because there are really no science. And that's why we um, decided to start a company uh, which then can do all of these things. And our starting point was really good. Um, our initial situation, we had good reputation, we had a very good method, which was winning uh, several blind competitions, and we already knew that we will have probably some customers because there was some growing interest from companies. And now I want to give you a short overview of the project, how it looks like, and how this fits with our business model we are trying to, uh, or which we are accomplishing. And so the s series, which is really the software suite, which connects everything and contains all the things that you need to have to make a good uh, analysis of your data. And this is a free of charge open source application where lots of our published algorithms are in there. It now contains roughly 180,000 lines of code. And um, yeah, everyone can install it on computer and start the analysis. And then for the machine learning part, we have these web services, which are seamlessly integrated into the software. And these web servers are hosted um, by the FSO Jena and by the Bright Joint Company. So this web service is proprietary, but all the methods we are using there, all the machine learning methods, they are published, they are described in very much detail, and now you can use this web service to perform state-of-the-art analysis. And yeah, the idea is that FSU Jena provides the web services free of charge to academic people, so everyone in academia can get a license and free of charge perform the whole analysis. And for commercial users, the Bright Giant will provide hosting and licenses. And what this allows us to do is, um, on the one hand, with the commercialization, uh, that we can provide the necessary support for uh, the industry users. Because, take for example, there is a scientist in a large, just a single scientist in a large pharmaceutical company who wants to use the software. Still, also, if it's not just one person, the software has to go to a large uh, security assessment process. And this can be very complicated, and for this um, they need uh, our help. Also, establishing workflows in a way that it really helps to analyze their data, they need a lot of expertise in doing so, which we can provide. On the other hand, we learned a lot from the companies because we now better understand use cases, how the software is used, and in the future we can use this in developing the software. And maybe the most important thing is that the resources we have with the company Bright Giant, we can use 
to provide now novel features, which we are certain they are useful for the software, maybe not scientifically so interesting, but for the user, super interesting. And uh, the features we provide with the company also improved the academic version. So basically, all academic scientists get a better product over time just because the company is then improving the software. And we also um, have a lot of goals uh, which we are trying to accomplish uh, with this project. One of them is that we really want to have this easy uh, usage and integration on many levels with the software because we have these users which uh, can code, which want to really um, write their own workflows and do high throughput, uh, throughput analysis on their data and decide uh, how they want to do it. On the other hand, we have many people from life science who just use a graphical user interface. And we already came very far uh, in uh, University of Jena doing so because we already provide user-friendly command line tools, graphical user interfaces and so on. But at some point there are still many features to come which only the company uh, can really provide because academia don't have the resources and time to do so. Um, and with such uh, uh, open source project like Sirius, you often hope for some interaction with a community because that's why you're also making it open that other people can participate. Um, but our software is really for a highly specialized application. So honestly, currently, most of the contributions are from us, so from University of Jena and from the company. So we're still looking to find ways how we can also help get other people onto this boat. Um, but because we always need a special kind of knowledge about it, it's not that easy. Still, um, for the university and for the company, we really think it's useful having this open source project um, because on the one hand it provides transparency, uh, uh, transparency because I mean this is the software you're installing on your computer and in principle you can look at the code, what it's actually doing there. Uh, it helps us to provide, um, uh, uh, to show the progress and also help integrate better with other, other projects in the community. Yes, and yes, I'm almost at the end of my talk and there are some lessons learned, some of them may be obvious, but I still like to restate them um, because I experienced them on my own. The first one is because we are providing a highly specialized application, we are not really selling only the software, we are selling our expertise, meaning it's not so easy possible to just start using the software and hoping you will find a workflow which will change the whole way you're doing your analysis. So it will take time and help to, to get to this uh, workflow. And so we are really helping with our expertise um, you know, in the adoption of our methods in these companies. And with that, we also get a strong connection to the people actually using our software. And we found this is also very, very important um, when selling software to large companies. Because we are a small company and then we are trying to sell our software, say, to a large pharmaceutical companies. And the procurement process, they are very, very long, very complicated, and having some support, a supporter inside the company who wants to use the software and thinks it's a good thing uh, uh, can really help you getting through all of this process. And the obvious lesson learned, you may think, is uh, the scientific community benefits obviously also from having successful software. Uh, in particular, this is uh, if the software becomes uh, more popular, uh, University of Jena becomes more popular, becomes more citations for the publications, but also in general, more scientists can solve 
novel research puzzles. And I think, especially in the field of bioinformatics we are in, there is now there is now so much data generated in the life science, more and more. And really, they need help in making kind of sense of this data because they can't analyze it just manually. And now having, on the one hand, maybe really the expert knowledge in the scientific field, and then finding also people which have expert knowledge in software development, and combining these to provide accessible software, which really also underlying has a complex um, computational method which solves the problem, I think this is something really which could benefit the whole community. And so I'm looking forward uh, to seeing all the other people trying to find a combination of both of these sides. And yeah, in the end, I like to thank you for your patience. And if you are interested in any of these, um, also, if you are not already working at a company, but maybe thinking about pursuing a PhD and like solving puzzles of combinatorics and machine learning, there are some nice puzzles at the Chair of Bioinformatics in Jena. Else, um, if you want to know anything more about our projects and our company, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I would just wanted to ask, I don't know if you can maybe answer this, but so you are mainly targeting enterprise customers or anyway, this kind of like company or are you also targeting maybe European grants or research grants or whatever to so, cover your... Uh, so the idea is that in principle, um, academic institutions should pay nothing for that just if um, they have a good reason to do so. But usually, I mean, academia don't have the money and should not provide the money to then uh, using the software, uh, if you meaning that. So we really um, targeting then biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, or some for-profit institutes, something like that. Okay, and, yeah, no, I was just wondering because, I mean, it sounds very interesting, it sounds like something that could also be supported by, say, an European project or something, but uh, I don't know the state of how it works. As a, uh, support for the project? There are many European projects uh, yeah. that, like, provide money to interesting scientific stuff, even yeah. without the output being a publication, so... I was just wondering. This. As a, uh, but are you talking more about funding or like? Yes. Uh, are you talking about funding? Yes, I mean, because we're um, trying to be also close still to science, I mean, um, funding options are certainly interesting. Some, uh, and also um, making use of these things as. Yeah. And yeah, thank you again. Sorry for technical problems in between, but in the end it worked out. <laughs>